A warm welcome to the latest edition of Eco Africa, the weekly environment show focusing on stories from Europe and Africa. I am Sandra Twinovio here in Uganda and joining me is my co-host Chris. Yes, hello from Nigeria. I'm Chris Alems. Wonderful to have you with us and hopefully we're going to inspire you. Here's what we have coming up over the next half hour. Electric rickshaws are helping the environment in Sudan. Filters on street drains trap microplastics to stop them entering the sewers. And we'll look at the ongoing fight to save the world's coral reefs. We start off the show with the sun, which is in plentiful supply in Africa, but not everyone takes advantage of it. Only a limited number of private homes in South Africa, for instance, have a solar panel on the roof. Most are still dependent on the coal-powered electricity grid. Others have no electricity at all. Just think of all the informal settlements. But there is hope. A German-African startup is teaching young people about solar power. In addition to bringing green energy to homes, it also generates jobs for younger generation. <music> South Africa is addicted to dirty energy. It produces more than 80% of its power from coal, making it the ninth largest CO2 producer in the world and creating a lot of problems. Droughts are becoming more common. In 2018, Cape Town, with its millions of residents, almost ran out of water. That's why South Africa has set an ambitious goal of shifting a quarter of its energy production to renewable sources by 2025. That includes solar energy. But how realistic is that? Private investors are building giant solar parks. Currently, their production capacity is 2.7 gigawatts, around 5% of the country's total power production. So South Africa has um, a really successful program to um, invest in, in utility scale solar, so massive solar farms. We've been, um, we've been really successful in building a program where people do that and, and we've got um, probably close to 60 of those farms up and running. But the country is still having trouble providing its citizens with reliable power. The state power company ESCOM is nearly bankrupt. Frequent blackouts are almost a daily occurrence. And here at Freedom Farm, an unincorporated settlement near Cape Town, there's no power at all. None of these homes are connected to the power grid. That's where the social enterprise iSolar comes in. Their solar power units provide power to individual homes and are a small part of South Africa's green transition. We send out messages to our clients, check on the panel, take care of it. And then you will have a, a, a long activity with, with, with our solar system. A house call for a customer. For around three euros a month, Joanna Plaches can light up her home. I'm not using candles anymore, fortunately. I can now switch the lights on instead and my kids can watch a bit of TV. Lights, TV and charging cell phones. That's the system's upper limit. But it's better than nothing and it is sustainable. iSolar has already provided affordable solar energy for around 2,000 people, including Joanna Plaches. For most households that draw power from state sources, the investment in solar power isn't very attractive. A high-capacity solar system is too expensive for many, and feeding the excess power back into the state grid isn't worth it. It's just make it easier for people to register their systems um, and get in on the system and, and legally comply. And so um, Cape Town is probably one of the municipalities that's gone the furthest in that regard. Um, many other municipalities don't have any kind of um, system in place. Like you won't get paid anything for power you feed back into the grid. But many large companies like the shopping center are opting for solar power systems. Less out of concern for the climate, but more out of fear of blackouts and raising energy costs. 
and that's causing a spike in demand for solar panels. Green Solar Academy teaches courses on solar panel installation. Useful knowledge for those looking to qualify as solar technicians. There are also people coming here that have no experience whatsoever. They come from a completely different industry, but they see the chance for themselves to develop uh, an opportunity here for themselves. Franz Lesiba is an electrician who wants to specialize. Taking part in the five-day course costs him around 700 euros. I want to open my own company and be my own boss. Yeah, so <laughs> that is the reason I'm here actually. Solar is the way to go. The economics of energy has changed a lot, so in, um, energy generation is being decentralized. You know, there's renewables just spreading everywhere. It's not just anymore that you have a, a cluster of coal-fired power stations that's powering the country. It's now spread everywhere. In South Africa, solar energy and other renewable energy sources like wind make up around 12% of the energy mix. Another 4% comes from nuclear power. For the country to reach its goal, it will have to double those numbers by 2025. Staying with solar power, Sudan is one of the largest economies in Africa, but it's been ravaged by conflict in recent years. The standard of living remains low for many. And now the war in Ukraine has also led to higher oil and gasoline prices. So how about solar-powered vehicles? We met an innovator whose electrically powered tuk-tuks are already saving money and benefiting the environment. Rush hour in Sudan's capital, Khartoum. Many people traveling to work or back home go on foot or take the bus. Few can afford a car of their own. That's why motorized rickshaws, or tuk-tuks, are often used in the city, which has over six million inhabitants. But rising gasoline prices mean that driving them increasingly doesn't pay. Sudan also has severe fuel shortages. Drivers have to stand in line for hours just to fill up. In Mohammed Samia's workshop, mechanics are working on an alternative, electric rickshaws. Some even have solar panels on the roof. After all, electricity in Sudan has also become more expensive and there are often power outages. The electricity problems will affect our vehicles. When power is unavailable, our drivers will be unable to charge them. So we installed a solar panel system in the tuk-tuks. That enables the vehicles to increase their range by up to 50 percent. Depending on their cargo, they can travel 80 to 120 kilometers. Last year, Mohammed Samia sold over 100 electric tuk-tuks. We considered Sudan's sustainable development goals in our model. We've been able to create jobs, and we manufacture a means of mobility that uses renewable energy and produces fewer emissions. He's convinced that transporting Khartoum will go completely electric at some point, making the city quieter and its air cleaner. Cool. Fancy a ride in one of those? But next, we head off to Europe for another less visible traffic-related issue. Cars and buses are, of course, major polluters, but not just on account of emissions. Microplastics generated by tyre and road wear from all traffic end up in our sewers, a phenomenon that German researchers want to put the brakes on in this week's Doing a Bit. More and more cars means more and more tyre wear. The resulting particles contain not just rubber and steel, but microplastics too. Through storm drains, these tire particles get into the sewers and flow into the sea. To stop them entering the water at all, researchers at Berlin's Technical University developed a special filter with support from the Audi Environment Foundation. The urban filter is installed in storm drains. 
Our goal was to address microplastics, mainly from tire abrasion. But of course, the wastewater from our streets contains much more, litter, and all the plastic packaging that gets thrown away. So the scientists also put larger particles through the filter. Recently, after 18 months of testing, they installed the first filter on a busy Berlin street and discovered to their surprise that most of the fine particles littering our roads are magnetic. Quite interestingly, we found out that magnets actually do interact with these especially fine particles. So now we're in the process of integrating such magnets, permanent magnets, into these shafts and our filter concept. Intelligent networking with the street cleaners is also planned. If heavy rains are forecast, streets should be swept beforehand to keep direct and microplastics out of the water altogether. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Back to Africa now. Fishing communities here and around the world are starting to feel the impact of extreme weather and the coastal erosion. Hundreds of residents of the Tato Islands off the coast of Sierra Leone have had to resettle on the mainland. The government has taken action, but will that intervention be enough? A couple of years ago, it was possible for the people of Nyangai Island to walk along this stretch without getting wet. But the rising sea level has split one of Sierra Leone's Turtle Islands in two. More than half of the island has disappeared. The archipelago was once a bustling fishing community. Now, 500 people have been forced to leave in the past few years because their homes were washed away by floods. One of them is Suleiman Kaba. He has already built two houses on the island. Now, even the second one is threatened by rising water. Most of his belongings, he says, have already been carried out to sea. This is where I grew up, and I have lived all my life here. It's where I built my house. First, the water washed away the last trees, and then it took my house with it. I built another house, but the water will soon take that one too. Now, I have left the island and settled on a larger one that's nearer to the mainland. Suleiman Kaba can't afford to resettle the whole family on the mainland immediately. His wife still lives on Niangai, and his children are with relatives. Starting a new life is expensive. Most people here live on no more than 10 cents a day. Suleiman Kaba now tries to save some of the money he makes from fishing, so one day the rest of his family can join him. Now he lives on Sherbro Island. But even there, he's afraid of flooding. The threat of rising sea levels is very real. A few years ago, waves broke through the flood wall. In order to restore the damaged seashore, the municipality and the government found international partners to finance this large-scale project. And this time, they want to do it better, says the mayor. We are worried that uh, if we, we are not proactive to take such decisions you know, to restoring the sea face wall and to also ensuring that we maintain our green mangrove cover, it will be disastrous for our people on Shabro Island. This new embankment will be almost two kilometers long and one meter taller than the highest tide measured so far. Now the authorities have started to involve the local population in measures to protect the climate. Mangroves are being planted. Fisherman Alpha Dello looks in on the young mangrove plants nearly every day. He says the roots will bind the soil and protect it from being washed away in the rainy season. 
These mangrove roots will help the ground become stable again. If we don't plant here, the problems will remain. Houses will be lost and people will have to migrate again. The mangroves and the embankment project give him hope, says Alpha Jello. But he knows that a lot more will need to be done to protect the homes and livelihoods of the thousands of people who still live on Sherbro and the smaller Turtle Islands. And while sea levels are rising, our oceans are home to a precious and endangered shelter for the marine life. Coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. But climate change and destructive human activity might soon see them disappear completely. Researchers are now trying out some very unconventional approaches to make the highly sensitive reefs more resilient. Coral reefs are unlike anywhere else on Earth. They're home to mind-blowing biodiversity. The world's reefs are shown here with red dots. They cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but they actually support over a quarter of all marine life. Considering these staggering statistics, it's easy to forget that they're actually built from tiny animals, coral polyps. Corals owe a great deal of their magic and their beautiful color to a complex cooperation between organisms. Algae live in the polyps' tissues and provide nutrients to the coral in exchange for protection. But this delicate teamwork is under threat from climate change. CO2 emissions dissolve in the seas, making waters more acidic and weakening coral skeletons. And that's not all. As global temperatures soar, coral reefs suffer through ever more frequent and intense ocean heat waves. Extreme temperatures cause the algae to produce harmful chemicals, prompting the coral polyps to kick them out. This is coral bleaching, where vibrant polyps turn white from heat stress, a process that can eventually prove fatal. And global warming is already driving vast bleaching events today. So we have to have multiple strategies in addition to marine protected areas. This is Lizzie McLeod, whose global coral reefs lead at the Nature Conservancy. Researchers like Lizzie McLeod are going one step further in the quest to help reefs resist climate change by investigating how to actually toughen coral reefs up. And so some of the, the strategies people are using is are taking corals that are, we call it stress hardened, so they're better able to deal with ocean warming and actually transplanting them, moving them from those areas to other areas with the hopes that they'll pass along that trait to their offspring and help the corals in that new area be better able to cope with warming. One way of doing this is to find naturally heat-resistant corals that have survived hot waters before and to transplant them from one reef to another. And these aren't the only cutting-edge techniques. Other teams are also hoping to toughen up the individual corals themselves. In, in my research, we are mostly focusing on increasing the, the tolerance of corals to heat. This is ecological geneticist Madeleine van Uppen. She's investigating a range of approaches to make corals more resistant to rising temperatures. For example, selectively breeding to toughen up the polyp animals, or alternatively, tinkering with the algae that give coral their colors. The microalgae that live inside the coral tissues, we can take them out of the coral, and most of these can be cultured in the lab. And in the lab, we can um, increase the, the rate by which these algae evolve. Madeleine van Uppen used this approach to create heat-resistant algae, which, when put back into polyps, created more heat-resistant corals. If we implemented every tool in our toolbox today, from marine protected areas, reducing pollution, using some of these more active interventions, stress hardening or manipulating the genetics of corals, it will not be enough to save coral reefs if we do not reduce emissions. That is absolutely central. The truth is that coral reefs are incredibly sensitive to warming waters. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned that even if the world limits global warming to 1.5 degrees, coral reefs could decline by 90%. If temperatures increase by two degrees, that figure is 99% or higher. 
Our environmental decisions around the world, whether that's reducing plastic use or limiting global warming, could make all the difference for the future of the world's reefs. We now resurface to our next land-based report. Zimbabwe loses around 300,000 hectares of forest every year. One reason, wood is banned to cure tobacco, a key cash crop in the country. But that also contributes to greenhouse emissions. What are sustainable alternatives? Industrial hemp might be one, but efforts to process the plant are still at an early stage. We decided to take a closer look at the concept of growing hemp on a large scale. It takes a lot of wood to heat this drying tower. Each year, farmer Takamori Muzurahona burns 60 truckloads full to cure some four tons of tobacco. As one of more than 100,000 small tobacco farmers in Zimbabwe, he earns a good living from his crop. I've been growing tobacco for close to seven years now, and it's transformed my life completely. I've managed to buy my own cattle and my own car. However, one result of growing tobacco is that sourcing firewood is now a challenge. Tobacco farming earned Zimbabwe more than 780 million US dollars in revenue in 2020. But its forests have paid a heavy price. It's estimated that Zimbabwe loses 60,000 hectares of woodland each year to tobacco production alone. These plants are meant to put a stop to the deforestation, industrial hemp. Zora Zai Maraviki gave up her job as a dentist to convince the country's farmers to cultivate hemp. She believes it can save not only the forest, but the climate too. An acre or hectare of trees absorbs four times less of carbon dioxide compared to industrial hemp. And we know that industrial hemp grows much faster than uh, trees. That means our hemp forests can do much more in a shorter space of time in helping us absorb, soil remediate and uh, lock away carbon. Hemp is also very hardy. It's less sensitive to rising temperatures and is easier to cure for than tobacco. But in contrast to tobacco, you can't smoke this hemp. Hemp farming is still in its infancy in Zimbabwe. There are just 100 hectares of hemp plantations in the whole country. Tikatiyi Gonisi is a hemp pioneer. His 2,000 hemp plants are intended for the cosmetics industry. He grows them in his own greenhouses, and his harvest goes to customers in Asia and Europe. He's hoping to earn a healthy profit, as every part of the hemp plant is valuable. The hemp uh, you use from the seed, from the leaves, from the stalk, and the roots also. So you don't throw away any, anything out of it. The tobacco, they use so many chemicals, and also they use uh, the, pro, the cost of producing tobacco uh, uh, is, is actually higher than the cost of producing uh, hemp. So it's going to overtake tobacco in the next five to ten years if we promote it well. He could be right. In 2019, the global market for industrial hemp was worth some five billion U.S. dollars, and demand is growing. Hemp fibers are used in the construction and auto industries, and for fashion accessories. Hemp seed for food and drink. So the prospects are good for farmers looking to make the switch. But in Zimbabwe, they still need to buy a license to grow hemp, and many can't afford that. Zorozai Maraviki has brought together a few farmers to try to convince them of the benefits of cultivating hemp. Takamori Muzoharana is here too. Because of the changing weather patterns, I now wish to complement my tobacco farming with other resilient crops. If our government can come in and support us farmers in growing crops like hemp, that's when it will become a success. Zorazai Maraviki has come to this trade fair in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe's second largest city. Many international exhibitors are here. She's hoping to find new clients as well as farmers who try their hand at growing hemp. The first export was definitely three tons of hemp flour into Switzerland. 
but we are seeing the numbers increasing. I think maybe to date in total we are almost getting to 20 tons. And they're all destined for export because Zimbabwe has no professional hemp processing industry. Just a few enthusiasts turning hemp fibers into handmade paper. And that's not enough if hemp is to save the country's forests. And that rounds off another show packed with information, innovation and ideas. Hope you had a lot of takeaways. Thank you for watching and goodbye from Uganda. Thanks also from me. Stay tuned and don't forget to visit us on our social media channels shown on your screen. Have a lovely week and bye from Lagos, Nigeria.